Okay, hello, it's Paul Green here with another one of our uh, Focus On panels. Um, today I'm joined by uh, Julia Marie-Louise and hopefully Andy Later, who's having a few technical issues. So we will uh, tune him in if he manages to sort of get here. So uh, before we sort of like crack on, do you ladies just want to introduce yourselves, let people know who you are and what you do? So Julie, do you want to go first? Yes, so hello everybody. Um, my name is Julie Futcher and I run a business called The Sales Ace. And what I do is I help business owners skyrocket their sales. I do that by um, sales training and sales consultancy, um, either in-house or through workshops. So that's what I do, Julie Futcher, The Sales Ace. Excellent, and Marie Louise. Yeah, so I'm Marie Louise O'Neill and my business is called Lovely Evolution. I'm a branding and Canva design specialist, so trained graphic designer and um, have been using Canva for since 2017. And not only design within Canva, I also offer various training options for non-designers. So it's perfect for small businesses who want to do it themselves in Canva. <laughs> That's me. Right. Okay, thank you. Andy's just joined us, so let's see if I can get him on the screen. Andy, can you hear us? And is your audio working? I'm guessing that's a no, unless he's just frozen. Oh. Bless him, he's not having a lot of... Um, not having a good day, is he? ...with technology. Okay, we'll leave him there for time being and crack on and see if he okay. tunes in. Um, so, um, yeah, we th what I thought we'd look at today um, is just the, what your thoughts are on how small businesses can best invest their sales and marketing budget. Should they have a budget? Should they be allocating a certain amount of their um, uh, turnover or profit to uh, marketing? And just, just really just to explore that, if we get any questions uh, from the floor, as I said, I can, or any of these live stream things, I can bring it on screen. And obviously there'll be, this will be replayed uh, um, elsewhere so people may comment at a later date. So, um, Julie, over to you then. What, what are your thoughts on um, small businesses and their sales and marketing budget? So, yeah, this is an interesting one. It's one I get asked an awful lot is how much should I invest in this? And... I think um, having some amount of money to look at marketing and sales, but it's a fallacy to say that you need lots and lots of money. Um, there is there are certain things that you can do. There's, there's a little that you can do. There's a lot if you really want to. Um, but I think it's looking at and being fully aware of, first of all, is about who your target market is. And before you start throwing money at all of these avenues of, of marketing, it's really thinking about that, thinking about your target market, really doing sort of an analysis on that, and then thinking about how they would want to be communicated with. So for example, if your target market is not on Facebook, why invest heavily in Facebook marketing? It's things like that. Um, I think from a sales point of view, um, one of the things that I, I talk to people about is a sales plan. That's really um, the first sort of step that you make, but you don't have to invest a lot of money in that. An Excel spreadsheet will work really well with that and a CRM system. Um, and there are lots of free CRM systems out there. There's lots of ones out there. I use personally something called Capsule. It's 12 pounds a month. It connects into my zero, it connects into my MailChimp, um, and it's really quite flexible. So I suppose my advice is don't spend lots of money if you don't need to. That's what I would say. ML, what do you think? So I think, like, like you said, Julie, you don't need to spend masses and masses of amount on it. I'd say it's about um, investing wisely and having a strategy about it mm. and I think um, a good use of your spend is to work with a um, marketing expert so Andy Sarson is is all about marketing um, or you know uh, get recommendations as well um, and you know that a lot of marketing experts um, offer sort of uh, you know, like a, a power hour type thing or an hour session or a couple of hours. And you can really kind of drill down and, you know, have that strategy, which you then implement um, either yourself 
Um, or, you know, another thing that is quite useful is to work with uh, virtual assistants as well. I think as small businesses, it's really easy to get really wrapped up in doing it all yourself. Mm. Um, I know it's something that I have myself where I'm trying to move away from doing everything myself and outsourcing a bit more so that I can spend um, my time on you know what I'm really good at. Mm. Um, and yeah, so it's working out where is your time and money best spent and the yeah. first port of call is if you're not a strategy board yourself um then you know paying for an expert to have that brainstorm so that you can be like okay what am i going to do for the year ahead um and and then you can focus then what do you do next how do you implement that i think i think outsourcing is a really good point um you know, I know when I first started my business seven, eight years ago, when I went self-employed, I personally didn't have the money to um, pay somebody to do anything. But very, very quickly, um, social media for me was something that I wanted to um, explore because my target markets were on that LinkedIn and Facebook. But I was spending hours trying to create the content, stream it myself. Um, and in the end, I just I just said enough and paid somebody to do it. And it was the best thing I did because I then could concentrate on what I was good at. They could take that away from me. And it was worth the money that I spent on it because I was able to generate more revenue just by concentrating on things. So I think that's a really good point, ML. Really good point. And also you can get into stuck into a bit of a hamster wheel yes. of being busy all the time because you are doing <laughs> these these tasks, you know, doing social media and all these things that are important, but you can easily waste your time um doing it if that's not your area of expertise or, you know, your time could be better uh spent doing something else. And yeah. You know you, that mental load <laughs> i've certainly experienced it myself where you're trying to do so much um and sort of being able to kind of grow a bit of a mini team and yeah. you can do that in in phases is is a good strategy to have in business in general like think about how you can outsource even if you plan to be always sort of a business of one but like a business of mm -hmm. one and kind of consultants that you work with yeah. Andy, have we got you on audio at the moment? Do you want to give it a go? No? No, he's having he's a He's put some stuff in the comments. I'll read out what he's put in the comments. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so he's, he's put, there's no doubt that marketing is an incredibly powerful tool for businesses. When done right, marketing can increase your business profile and brand to prospects, showing your products and services the solution to their needs, needs but ultimately driving inquiries and increasing sales. But let's be honest, it doesn't always work. Mar marketing is not a magic wand. There are plenty of ways your marketing efforts can fail, but you don't want to hear that when you're investing in marketing, do you? I guess you don't. No, so yeah. you touched on um, target marketing, Julie, in your initial yeah. comment, which is, in my experience, a lot of small businesses don't tend to have a target market. And my view is that they somehow think that by narrowing down their target market, rather than just sort of saying they can supply services to all businesses, they think they're actually going to miss out on opportunities. What What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I've had those conversations before. And in actual fact, um, it works the opposite in my experience. Um, trying to be all things to all people, you dilute um, your message, your product. Um, for me, when I'm working with clients on sales strategy, we really make sure that we are um, understanding who our target market is. From a mar marketing perspective, it's then how you communicate with that target market and making sure that you're in the mediums of where you're going to attract them, the message is right. From a sales point of view, in a target market is really understanding their needs, their wants, their issues, their problems, how you actually benefit, what's your USP, and how you have those conversations with people from a, I call it with them, a what's in it for me factor, so that they'll come to you. Um, becoming a specialist in areas which a lot of my clients have done has actually increased their, mar their market um, and has increased their revenue because you then really niching down, people come to you because you are an expert in that field. Um, 
so take me for example um my background is recruitment when i do sales training in that i win a lot of business in that area because that is a, a specialist area for me i don't just do recruitment i do right across the board another one that i seem to do a lot of specialism in is engineering and technical sales um and again i have clients come to me because i have that understanding of what it means to be in those markets so um yeah from those point of view um it's absolutely key. It helps your, it helps your marketing budget because you're focused. Um, it helps your time budget. And I use time budget because we've only got a certain length of time. You're, you're just putting all of your time into those, those particular areas. Um, and that is key. So, you know, when I sit down and look at sales planning with people um, and sales strategy with people, this target market is absolutely key. And, and for me, sales and marketing should do this. It should, should really knit together, one feed complement each other. So yeah, um, that's my thoughts on it. Yeah, Andy's commented that uh, you're quite right. You'll be pleased to know. Uh, he said it's Thank crucial you. to understand where marketing efforts can go wrong. Uh, that way you can avoid many issues that businesses encounter. It's still relatively early in the year and I wanna make sure you have the right marketing strategy and plan to reach your target market. Marie-Louise, your thoughts? So um, I agree that having a clear idea of who you want to work with and who you don't want to work with is at the foundation of your branding, marketing and sales. And I think it's a step that people often skip over. And uh, even if you do it to quite a surface level um, and definitely putting it down on paper or creating some sort of document where you kind of bring that person to life. You might have more than one ideal client. Um, within the business community, we've got Jessica Shales from Ideal Marketing that um, really has, has done some really great guest talks as part of the you know business community meetings. Um, and both Julie and I are in her marketing course. So we're we're really digging down. We've we've done quite a lot of work on ideal clients already, but it's great to go into another layer of detail, which I think is definitely going to impact and improve our own marketing efforts yeah. going forward. Yeah. But I, I think the thing the thing for me is that, you know, knowing who you want to work with, who you want to attract from a branding and design point of view is also important because it's going to uh, decide what colors you use, fonts, what's, what does your logo look like, uh, imagery, all of those things. Um, and as well as the messaging as well, you know, and, you know, when you're networking, being able to say, I work with X, Y, Z, I'm looking for this, that or the other you know, as well as obviously the services you offer, but mm. by being giving specific examples when you're having a one to one with someone means that they're able to be like, ah, you know, the light bulb goes off. And um, as Judy says, you know, far from um, turning people away, people think, oh, well, OK, well, there's that transferable skills or, you know, th there's enough similarities that even though I'm not in that specific category that this person's talking about I could fit into it you know yeah or it helps with referrals so it absolutely does help um it rather than by niching down it narrows your um your kind of opportunity to work it also cuts out competition so I don't I don't think I'm really in direct competition with people because I'm so clear about who I want to work with the value that I offer my methodology and my ideal clients, that even though I know a number of branding strategy experts, a number of designers, for the most part, I don't feel that I'm in competition. In fact, I've collaborated with them because I've defined that clear niche of mm -hmm. being recognized for that. Yeah. People think of Canva, people think of me. I'm okay with that, I <laughs> think great. <laughs> and hashtag that's the power. Girl. Yeah, hashtag Canva girl. Um, but the power of that is being known as that specialist. Yeah. Building up that recognition yeah. and the opportunities that can lead to is incredibly powerful. Yeah, and and I, I agree with you. I know um, I set out, when I set up my previous business as sales manager and, and sales ace, I set out to be an expert in my field and that's what I've done. Um, and people think sales think Julie. I think one thing that was kind of going through my brain as we were talking about defining markets 
is you have to analyze this and review it as well and look at what is successful. Um, I like to try and review every six months the marketing activity I'm doing versus return on investment. Now, some of that is a long-term return on investment, um, things like social media. You're not going to have people flocking to your doors within the first five minutes. Um, but it is important to review that. And that's where, um, again, small businesses fall down because they keep throwing money at things thinking they're working when actually they're not. The shiny, um, shiny thing syndrome. Yeah, quite shiny thing syndrome. And, you know, you you have to, if you've got a limited budget, you know, yes, in the early days of when you start your business, you try things, things come along, you try it. Okay, well, I'm prepared to throw X amount of money at it and see what happens. But you also have to be really brutal with it and say, actually, after six months, this isn't working for me. I haven't seen anything. Um do I continue this for another three or do I say, do you know what? I've tried it. Let's walk away and let's try something else. Um, and that's something that I'm pretty hot on. Um, LinkedIn, for example, for me, has always been a really, really good revenue generator. The business community as a networking tool and referral tool, again, for me, has been um, a fantastic revenue generator, hence the reason why Paul will never get rid of me because <laughs> so he might think that's a good thing he might not so you're not just for Christmas then um, <laughs> no. and has put many small businesses simply doing doing some marketing without any thought about how it fits in with your overall business goals perhaps chasing a new trend or someone has said you should be doing a particular activity um, in my opinion these are the reasons marketing fails and then also uh, Adam's made a few comments Adam Payne thanks for tuning in Adam so he's just sort of referring to the earlier comment that, yeah, marketing sales should be aligned. I think that was your comment, Julie. Mm -hmm. And then also sort of referring to the customer avatar, sort of talking about looking at the psychographics, not just demographics of the thing. Mm -hmm. And then uh, finally, he agrees with you, Marie-Louise. So you've got a raving fan out there. So uh, <laughs> thanks, thanks for your comment. <laughs> if anybody is listening to this or tuning in now or on a, a replay, then please do... Uh, uh, ask a question, put something in the comments on whichever platform you're viewing on or the chat, um, and we'll try and address it. So um, in terms of uh, the amount of money that somebody should spend on marketing, do you have a feel for a percentage of either their turnover or their profit that they should be reinvesting in their business? Do you have a gauge for that in your experience? Well, I have heard that it should be around uh, 10 to 20 percent of your turnover or profit. I'm not really sure. There is some sort of general, broad, advised um, percentage of, of, of that. But um, I guess it depends it, where you're at on on your kind of business journey. If you're a startup, you, you, you've got a certain amount of either savings or money that's coming in each month that you can put aside so it's not so much about kind of what you projected want to earn and then putting in that uh, as your marketing budget you know 10% of that um, but I think it comes back to uh, being strategic about what you're spending on your money um, if if money is tight you know it's been a difficult couple of years don't stop marketing you know don't stop you know don't do all of that but just um think what can you dial back and what can you focus on and just define what feels reasonable for you as a small business owner to mm. spend on and look to again you know the the bigger picture or longer term thing of <clears throat> what you can spend right now because you don't want to you know put yourself out of business by going crazy with marketing um, and you know spending money on everything um, but then think about what you might want to increase your marketing budget later on or next year you know again sort of if you've got that strategy of what you want to be earning you can also attribute some of that potential earnings or future you know earnings towards that marketing so that you keep filling that funnel of leads and that you know work I think the other thing that I would add to that, and I agree with what you've said, ML, is also it depends on the average cost of your customer, in my opinion. So if you are a business that are attracting 
bis um, or, or sort of your product you're offering is something of high value, then probably what you're going to spend on your marketing to attract those types of customers might outweigh what somebody whose average customer might only be spending 50 to 100 pounds. Mm. Um, and so I, I think that has to be taken into consideration. A consultancy might, or a consultant might um, be prepared to spend a bit more because from their, um, yes, um, Adam's just put something up in there saying cost per acquisition. Um, it is about a consultant might spend more because their average customer spend is quite high. Somebody running a, I don't know, a, a small sort of card gifting business might spend less because their customers spend less. So that for me, again, goes back to the analysis of your target market, knowing who really being clear about who that market is and who you're talking to. Um, yeah. Does that make sense? It does. Yes. I think that's a, a, an easier yeah. and better way of um, looking at it because it's more immediate because you can then adjust that marketing spend as, as you grow. Because again, often um, when people are sort of earlier on in their business, you know, what they're charging may, you know, their pricing strategy might be a bit lower until they've established themselves, done that work on, on getting the pricing right. And then obviously that may uh, evolve and grow over time as well. Um, so yeah, I think that's a really nice way of, of doing it because you're not kind of thinking about, you know, something that may or may not happen. You can you can be a bit more um, flexible out through, through the months. Yeah, just to bring Andy in the uh in our silent office um so he's put going back he's put the lack of strategy you don't understand your customers no real calls to action using wrong channels poor targeting not patient enough to achieve results test and adapt is a good way forward and his comment is with regard to spend rule of thumb in his view is seven to fifteen percent of turnover on uh marketing um is a question for you from uh, mark exley what if your target market is broad we've just Okay, so this is interesting, Mark, because we, we had a, um, a conversation. I don't know if you've been in from the beginning. Um, it depends what you mean your target market is broad. It goes back to really screwing into who those individuals are in that marketplace. So if your target market is broad and you're dealing with every, cust every type of business from one-man bands through to corporate businesses, you almost have to have separate avatars for each of those target markets, understand each of those target markets and analyze your cost per acquisition and then go out and spend on advertising or marketing for um, those sorts of um, markets. You can't just blanket market. Uh, and Andy has said this earlier, it's about strategy. And that's where strategy comes in. I would also, and I've had conversations with, with my clients when they say their market is broad. And I said, really? Really, is it that broad? Because who is it your product actually benefits? And for me as a salesperson, the conversations I'm always having with my client is how does your product and service meet the needs, wants, issues and problems of that particular marketplace? Yeah, Mark, Mark's elaborated and just sort of said uh, multi-sector, wide range of turnovers, et cetera. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, there are going to be certain instances if you look at your customer base that it is seemingly diverse. But my view is if you really break it down to who is your ideal customer, what works best for you, you probably will find a more defined pattern. Yeah. And even if you do have a diverse range, you've still got to think about your marketing. You know, because if someone comes to your homepage on your website you're trying to be all things to all people and you're not directly relating your product or service to the person that's landed on your website i think that's an issue so you know you've really yeah. got to think about you know how you it's not just the websites in all your marketing just use your website as an example is um you know make sure you've you're sending people to specific landing pages that talk about the specific issues they're facing and the problems you can address because it won't be the same for every type of business in terms of what you're offering you know that they won't be getting 
uh, the benefits for them will be different for each each different sector and each different type type of business in my yeah. view so it's a bit, bit go on julie i'm, so I'm going to add to, to that as well is don't forget who do you want to work with yeah and i yeah. think sometimes we forget that as small business owners um yes our product or service might benefit a number of different industry sectors business sizes etc but that doesn't mean to say that we have to market to all of those it might be that you have a look at things and decide that actually i only want to work with a certain industry or a certain size of business because that's what you want to do and i am a big advocate of you choose how you do business you shouldn't be you shouldn't be pushed into doing with business with certain areas just because you think you have to it's about what you want your business to look at and again those are conversations that i have with a lot of my clients the word should comes out all the time and i say no not should what do you want mm -hmm. i'm okay. sorry go on Amel. i was just gonna sort of um come back to mark mark Exley's, um comment and just i would challenge you and uh to uh or give you a bit oh, of fine, homework fine. <laughs> <laughs> no not challenging that in terms of i i think it it's a very powerful exercise to try and uh, identify um some different categories mm. of ideal clients because we all have different you know there isn't just it's very rare to be so you know particularly small businesses we, we don't really generally go oh we only work with that kind of one person we tend to have multiple um ideal clients and um but you know and, and that kind of maybe slightly broader niche so i would say try and um you know dig down and think about you know what are the commonalities you know are there different categories and if you've got say three and then the more detailed you can go the better because it's more getting inside that person's head. And again, thinking it's great also for content as well, because you're then thinking about, well, what problem does that particular ideal client have? And you can create a social media post for it. You could do a LinkedIn article answering that. It could be a blog post. And then suddenly you're not sitting there going, oh, what, what am I gonna like, what am I doing? And it comes back to going, okay, these are the different categories of people I want to communicate to. These are the problems that they have that I solve. And you can create some quite targeted messaging and content aimed at them. Yeah, uh, Adam just made another comment about being true to your personal core values, principles and behaviours, which I think is also true. I think the issue is when you start a small business, you know, I'm not sure whether desperate is the word, you're keen to get on any anybody that you can. And uh, therefore, you know, I don't think you consider, when I first started, I, I didn't consider target market. I just thought, you know, I'm going to go out there open my stall and they will come and buy sort of thing and uh, yeah i wasn't very choosy about who i dealt with um, in the early days and i think that that can be an issue if going forward if you're not able to cleanse your client base mm -hmm. at some point when you realize you do need to focus on a particular type of uh, uh business uh kevin's commented uh i have people in sex i specifically don't work with as a starting point that's probably because they don't like you, Kevin, isn't it? I mean, come on. <laughs> I think that is actually a very good point that Kevin makes because it's sometimes, especially when you're starting out to define who you want to work with, sometimes it's easier to say who you don't want to work with. And by looking at you, who you have worked with in the past um, and, and again, that you haven't liked working with, you know, what was it? What were the issues there with it? Um, that means that they wouldn't be a good fit, as well as thinking, you know, who have you worked with that was really great to work with? And as um, Adam said, it may be more value based. So you're, you may not be niching down like by industry or this or that, but maybe it's about actually when you have that one to one with someone who's a potential client, is there a connection there? You know, are they an idiot? <laughs> and therefore, you're like, thank you, next, in the nicest possible way, you know. Um, but, you know, you, you are your own, it's your business. You, no one is forcing you to work with that idiot. No one, no one, is, you Not know, if you say no, rules. exactly. So, you know, don't work with idiots. That's my 
That's my key amazing. That's your advice. top tip for the day. Yeah, yeah, my <laughs> thought of the day. But, don't work with if idiots. Nobody, if nobody leaves with anything else, that is what don't you need to leave with. Don't but, work with idiots. But picking I'm up on what you too said, too Paul. Relatively. I think picking up on what you said, Paul, about in the early days when you start your business, you want, you know, you're taking what business you can. And you do because at the early days, you know, you're establishing your brand. You're finding what works for you. You've got your mortgage to pay, you know, and things like that. You've got bills to pay. But certainly as the time goes on, you your confidence grows. Um, you are more confident in your offering and what you're doing. And then you're then starting to get a feel for where your specific, um, what's the word I'm saying, where you want to work who you really do value you're going to good value with and sometimes i mean i think about some of the uh, you know the evolution of of how i've worked in self-employed you know in the early days i've i've clung on to offering particular services because it's an emotional thing um but actually now i'm quite brutal with it but that's taken five six years even me to be quite brutal about no it's not working let's just let's just not um I so think I, I think i found you quite brutal since i met you julian fair yeah but you like that paul <laughs> <laughs> you, well, know, you pay me for that <laughs> well, moving rapidly on and bringing andy back into the conversation so um andy sort of commented once you've got your marketing right and working don't forget the value of customer experience that'll probably mm. be a topic for a future one of these actually because i think it's important and it's build the relationship with them to ensure they stay as customers and are happy to refer you and again we'll probably look at referrals mark ferguson has commented but the comment's quite long mark so we'll try and bring it up but i'm not sure it will take up the whole of the screen yeah it doesn't it doesn't actually sort of like come up so he's just put shall I probably read it rather than so mark's tuned in sort of picking up on the target marketing comments uh, it's important to avoid the term general public. We begin with who's the audience, what are their needs, what's our message uh, in our response, message in response, how do we communicate this to them effectively, truthfully and creatively, what do we want them to do, i.e. act with this information, always keeping in mind the audience, so what and what's in it for me, which you touched on uh, earlier, Julie, so thanks mm. for that, Mark. Um, Can I just, just pick up a point on what Andy said about don't forget the customer experience and generating customers where you've got referrals. And this is a, a really big point and a good point for sales. So we spend an awful lot of time and we're talking about what money we should be spending on marketing and what we, we should be spending on sales. But actually, if you, when you start to build your business, build a business where your customers keep coming back to you, you then generate the business where you've got lots of regular customers coming through. You don't have to spend then masses on marketing because you've got this lovely regular business. You've got people that refer to you um, and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I work with a lot of companies that spend a lot of money on new business development. And when I go in on a consultancy basis and say, that's absolutely great. Now let's look at how you're retaining clients. They kind of look at me as if I've gone out. They don't invest the time. Um, so Andy's point is a really, really big one. You know, you're, if customers are spending with you, keep that relationship. What else have other products and services that you can um, offer them and upsell and cross sell? Because that's cheaper than investing lots more money in generating new customers. So I'm multitasking in the background. I was just looking at the quote. I you were stunned by, and by my answer there, Paul. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you brutal person. <laughs> but, um, I've, <laughs> now, the quote I was looking for, because I want to sort of bring up the, the, the topic of, um, well, let, let me tell you the quote and then take it from there. So a guy called John Wanamaker, who was a famous industrialist in the sort of uh, uh, 1800s, uh, early 1900s said half the money I spend on advertising is wasted the trouble is I don't know which half and I think that's <laughs> a, a, an issue for businesses as well uh, because what they're not doing is they're not really measuring mm. the effectiveness of the different channels that they're doing they they're um, uh, using to market their their products and services so what, what what are your thoughts on that then what what are the way what should small businesses be measuring how do they measure it is it easy to measure? You know, what, what sort of things should they be doing? For me, um, I think it's important. I encourage my clients to do that. 
And what I do is really simple. I, I'm really not a complex sort of person. Is I analyze um, in six months um, what invoices that I've sent out. And then I analyze where did that business come from? And I do it on a spreadsheet. Um, CRMs, I think, can do that. My, I've yeah. just set my CRM system to yeah. do that. And I review it. And I look at the common denominators. Um, so I know from my business, business community, LinkedIn, and referrals are the key things that generate probably 80 to 90% of the business that, that comes in, newer business. If you, I mean, I'm, I have, like Andy's done, created a business where customers keep coming back to me. I've got clients who've been with me 20 years through different sorts of um, uh, uh, careers. And yes, I am that old. Um, I was, was going to say you must have started when you were 12, actually. No, oh, Paul, you're now my favourite person. Um, so, yeah, that it, it is that. And I've lost my train of thought, so I'm going to pass over to ML now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, um, really. so, so, yeah, so I'm aware of the, the, the shoulda, woulda, coulda when it comes to tracking, um, you know, performance of marketing. And I don't really, um, I do make a note of, you know, who who's referred work to me um you know or who's recommended me i do try and track that but i haven't formalized it um i do have a uh, very technical spreadsheet <laughs> in google sheets with like leads and things and i think it'd be good to put a column in there of um you know where where did i meet that person i have like it in the notes but i think it'd be good to to revisit that and uh, check that but from time to time i have done a bit of an audit you know in terms of uh networking you know where am i networking what kind of business have i got out there what what did it you know how did that perform in terms of of money in so yeah so i i do very loosely keep an eye on where things are coming in from but not in probably in a, a measurable way it could be better there's room for improvement i'm not perfect yeah, I, think I, think, I, no, I, think, I think you're typical like a lot of small businesses you know the order comes in and you crack on delivering it don't you without necessarily worrying about where it came from um and i think you know that you don't want to what do they call it paralysis by analysis you don't want to spend in half your week analyzing where the business comes from and but some simple and the simple things you know even just asking people how did you find out about me if, if, if it's not clear um and certainly with technology today it's a lot easier to use tracking emails tracking landing pages tracking phone numbers for any campaigns that you're doing that don't cost a lot of money and will actually give you an indication of you know where that lead has actually come through and sometimes people don't remember in fairness you know you, often the answer i get is you know i googled you um is you know is as good a reason as any but yeah you know, that's hard to sort of uh, have any real control over other than sort of seo and your, your website of the yin yang um so yeah but, but i think it is important to to you know have some idea of uh, you know where uh, where those opportunities are coming from because of course if you know a certain marketing channel is working if you bet x you get 5x back then you know usual rule of thumb i'm sure andy will agree is you know that that will continue to happen um and then you know just keep fine tuning that just keep fine tuning your message fine tuning what you're doing on those channels just to make sure you um you know get the highest number of leads in and then it's down to conversion rate which is probably another yeah. conversation for another day um so i think we've also spoken a lot on here about monetary value and what we should be spending on our businesses in marketing and sales but there's also a time element that we should be spending on our businesses. Um, we as small business people, um, you know, and I, I know this because I, I'm on my own now. <laughs> oh, <it's gentle. laughs> we, Any more of your family gonna randomly <laughs> okay, I'm expecting to see your mother next. Yeah. Um, we we get <laughs> caught up in, in the day-to-day -day running of our business, but in these sort of things that we're talking about, we need to take that time out to actually work on our business and not in our business. Now, I Monday mornings for me are great. I spend probably an hour and a half on a Monday morning. I do the accounts. I look at my my sales plan. I look at where I'm at, what I need to do, where I need to sort of be a bit more active on marketing. And I have a quarterly planning session with myself. Um, you know, before COVID, I used to go and sit in a nice hotel 
have a nice lunch with myself, get the spreadsheet out and actually just spend some time away from the world thinking about what I want to achieve over that next quarter. And that for me is an investment of time. It's just so important. And unfortunately, too many small business owners, we run on a hamster wheel. It's all up here. It's not on a piece of paper. Um, it's not there in front of them. Um, and it's for me, it's almost like that exercise of being accountable to myself to actually achieve what I want to achieve. So that would be my piece of advice. MLs is don't work with idiots. Mine is take time to work on your business, not in your business. Okay. Any last comment, Andy? Because that seems like a nice uh, uh, place to end if you want to type anything in the chat. Um, just give him a chance to do that. So, yeah, if you if you have tuned into this on replay and you want to ask any questions, um, even though we won't be live, I'll tag these guys into where this is appearing so they can always come back to you and respond to you. I'll just sort of see how fast a typer Andy is. Or well, whilst he's doing that, uh, Mark's just made another comment there. Mm. <clears throat> the balance between working on your business and your business, most of us are selling our time and that is how we generate business. Yeah, it's definitely a balance. Yeah definitely a balance but it's putting it in your diary and making sure it happens mm. if you a client meeting in your diary you do it so that meeting with yourself get that in the diaries come on Andy type faster got other things to do <laughs> his little fingers are a blur down there I know. <laughs> <laughs> like a little hamster he's like a little hamster on the keyboard not in a wheel it's a cat meme on the gift yes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah good impersonation ml thank you i uh, practiced it earlier <laughs> yeah. i thought you were going to do an impression of a hamster in a wheel at one point when you made that comment <laughs> okay so and and is eventually commented my thought thought for the day sometimes marketing isn't the problem it might be the business owner interesting <laughs> that might be a topic for another time so thanks guys for um uh, joining me today and uh, sharing your knowledge experience and advice i really appreciate it so thank you for that uh, nice to sort of see your husband and jensen joining in marie louise as extra things i think jensen had the best exit of realizing <laughs> it, be the it was yeah I can, almost, I can almost hear the sort of like beep 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 <laughs> as he was reversing so, uh, so yeah Joy's so working at home fun. yeah no, it's so holiday. <laughs> Just, just didn't see you didn't see your cat this time ML. so anyway so thanks, thanks, thanks again guys uh thanks to those of you that sort of like tuned in either live or uh, on the replay and uh, just to let you know what we're ne doing next week um so we're focusing on operations and resources next week and we're going to take a look at what impact has the last couple of years had on employees so please tune into that and um as i said we'll end it there bye for now <laughs>